During the Cold War, the world's oceans were awash in American nuclear weapons. Most of these deployments remained a secret until the 2016 declassification of a report titled Nuclear Weapons Afloat revealed the full extent of America's nuclear stockpile at sea. Aboard surface ships, submarines, and aircraft carriers, over 5,000 nukes crisscrossed the waters of the world, posing an often unknown threat to any that encountered them. The risk of nuclear accidents was extremely high, and a number of incidents including explosions, collisions, and fires brought these sea-based weapons only seconds or feet away from disaster. Nukes at Sea The formally classified data released by the Department of Defense reveals the impressive amount of nuclear weapons afloat between the 1950s to early 1990s. Maritime distribution reached an all-time high in 1975 when 6,191 nuclear warheads were at sea, the same year the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission got split into the Energy Research and Development Administration and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. For reference, 2019's American arsenal reportedly counted on only 2,821 nuclear weapons. In the early 1960s, this stockpile surpassed 30,000 weapons. The majority of these weapons were sent to the Atlantic Ocean as a preemptive defense mechanism against the USSR to protect both the US and its NATO allies. Interestingly enough, while the data on nuclear weapons afloat is distributed under the classifications Atlantic, Pacific, and Mediterranean, it's unclear how exactly these designations were made. If the designations refer to the oceans themselves, key data on nuclear armed ships in the Arctic and Indian Oceans would be excluded, and certain shifts in the information such as 1987 reporting no weapons in the Mediterranean would be inaccurate. The other option would be for the classifications to refer to different commands under the U.S. military, in particular the Atlantic, Pacific, and Sixth Fleets. Yet the truth of the matter remains clouded in mystery. After 1991, when President Bush Sr. announced the removal of non-strategic nuclear weapons from surface ships, the information was cut off. While missiles continued to be deployed to the world's waters, the exact details on how many and where is kept secret. Nuclear Accidents Carrying these nukes on ships and submarines without an attack target did not mean that they always remained unused, as with any moving vehicle, these vessels were subject to accidents, which could have devastating consequences for intelligence, technology, marine, and human life. The nuclear weapons themselves became compromised during a number of incidents, exploding accidentally or even being lost at sea. Cold War tensions also posed a threat, as they did in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In 1962, Soviet and U.S. vessels patrolled with their nuclear weapons, ready to shoot at any second. While the accidental loss and endangerment of such important and potentially harmful tools of war may seem baffling, events unfolded where such accidents did occur. In 1965, an A-4E plane armed with a B-43 thermonuclear weapon simply rolled off the deck, sinking with the bombs somewhere between Vietnam and Japan. The sunken aircraft and cargo have yet to be found. More so, in an attempt not to infuriate the Japanese, who have had a ban on nuclear weapons ever since the conclusion of World War II, the Navy reported the accident as having taken place over 800 kilometers away from the nearest Japanese coast, while records showed that the incident actually took place less than 130 kilometers away from the Ryukyu Island chain. Then again in 1968, the attack submarine USS Scorpion, which was nuclear-powered and reportedly carrying at least one nuclear weapon rumored to be a Mark 45 torpedo, suffered an undisclosed accident and sunk about 600 kilometers away from the Portuguese Azores. To this day, the details of the cargo and the incident remain top secret. Perhaps more challenging and dangerous were the accidents involving fires or explosions that also interfered with the relatively peaceful but threatening movement of mass destruction weapons around the world. On January 14, 1969, the USS Enterprise was being escorted by two destroyers when an MK-32 Zuni rocket on an F-4 Phantom parked on the carrier exploded from overheating caused by starting a nearby engine. The fuel tank of the aircraft exploded as well, launching a chain of explosions throughout the carrier, which took over the back of the ship. At the time, the carrier probably had over 90 nuclear weapons on board and was powered by eight reactors. The response to the fire was immediate and was soon brought under control. The carrier was then taken in for repairs at the naval shipyard in Pearl Harbor, which was only 112 kilometers away from where the incident took place. Another great risk posed by the nuclear-armed ships was that of collision, 
the potential for destruction would be exponentialized if two nuclear-armed ships crashed, or worse, if two nuclear-armed ships from different nations collided. That could start a war. On November 22, 1975, the USS John F. Kennedy carrier and the USS Belknap cruiser crashed into each other during nighttime exercises near Sicily. The crash provoked fires to break out on the cruiser, which lasted over two hours. Worry among the leadership of the John F. Kennedy spread that the W-45 Terrier missiles on the Belknap might have been adding fuel to the flames. The Kennedy itself was carrying unguided nuclear bombs. Once the fire was under control, it was revealed that the nuclear warhead magazine had only escaped the flames by a couple of feet. An immense tragedy was avoided that day, by sheer luck. In May of 1974, an accidental collision occurred between the USS Pintado nuclear-powered submarine and a Yankee One-class from the USSR near the Petropavlovsk naval base. The USS Pintado was carrying five nuclear sub-rock missiles at the time, while the Yankee carried 32 nuclear warheads. The Yankee caused damage to the Pintado's sonar, the diving plane, and a side hatch. Fortunately, the collision did not make either explode, although both vessels were damaged. The Pintado had to spend almost two months in Guam under repairs. Two years later, in August of 1976, U.S. anti-submarine warships were chasing a nuclear-armed Echo 2-class submarine. The chase went on for about 10 days, until the USS Vosges frigate caught up with it, and then the Soviet submarine was sent to run into the ship, tearing off its propeller and damaging the hull. Rumored to carry multiple ASROC rockets, setting off the weapons would have destroyed the Vosges, and perhaps the Echo 2-class along with it. These extremely close calls, and on occasion irreparable losses, were only part of a broader threat. Having atomic weapons traveling around for defense and deterrence efforts risked not only igniting a war with enemy forces, but provoking and challenging allies beyond what they could tolerate. Diplomatic Matters The nuclear weapons management and distribution by the U.S. armed forces throughout the Cold War era required elegant and efficient diplomacy, often skidding through ally concerns or fully misrepresenting the truth. Since the number of nations whose waters the U.S. ships frequented had bans on the presence of nuclear weapons on their territories, many U.S. officials took the stance of neither confirming nor denying whether any weapons were aboard ships. Despite this, international public sentiment varied, and not every country was willing to eat up on the uncertainty the United States was trying to feed them, especially civilians and members of the press. This turned almost every warship port visit for fuel, trade, or goodwill expedition into a public relations and diplomacy challenge. American military ships were greeted by protests and public resentment in countries all over the world, including key allies. Foreign governments were put in the awkward position of having to balance and prioritize their anti-nuclear policies against their interest-driven agreements with the United States. Due to the ban on atomic bombs placed by Japan, and the history of having the United States as the bombing party in World War II, the Japanese were particularly conflicted by the presence of American nuclear-armed ships. Despite much public resentment, the Japanese had to agree to receive these vessels in their waters for the sake of preserving Japanese interests and safety. On the other end, opposition from citizens to nuclear presence in New Zealand during the 70s and 80s turned into significant political pressure, forcing the government to ban visits by ships powered by nuclear energy or carrying nuclear weapons. President Reagan cut off defense support for New Zealand in response, believing Europeans would be intimidated into straying away from banning nuclear weapons. The measure had the opposite effect. In 1988, the Danish parliament passed a resolution that made every single visiting warship receive a message clarifying nuclear weapons were not allowed in the country. Europeans were becoming increasingly upset under a feeling of powerlessness in front of governments that refused to hold the United States accountable when its warships approached their seashores. And maybe the threat of losing allies over the entire practice posed a greater security threat than a few accidents. Nuclear Posture Review President George H.W. Bush gave a rare televised address to the American public in September of 1991 that marked the beginning of a shift in nuclear policy. He stated, quote, We are now moving to reshape the U.S. military. The new base force will be smaller, with fewer strategic nuclear forces. He announced that the United States would act unilaterally, but invited the dissolving Soviet Union to act in reciprocity, saying, quote, We now have an unparalleled opportunity to change the nuclear posture of both the United States and the Soviet Union, and reinforcing the idea multiple times. The promise to reduce American nuclear weapons was paired with reducing the presence of such weapons abroad, 
with claims that tactical nuclear weapons on surface ships and attack submarines would be removed for dismantling and destruction. While the promise to withdraw nuclear weapons from submarines was not completely followed through, the general premise was, and the nuclear weapons afloat were almost completely removed halfway through 1992. Part of the reason why some of the weapons were kept in submarines, and a high number of them on land ready for deployment by aircraft, is explained in the following extract from the Annual Defense Report from 1994, issued under the Clinton administration. Quote, Although the security environment has changed dramatically since the end of the Cold War, there's still great uncertainty about the future, particularly in the new independent states where the process of denuclearization and reduction is underway, but by no means completed. The United States must provide a hedge against this uncertainty. Therefore, the NPR stresses prudence in the face of potential risks, while also identifying some new policy departures that reflect changes in the security environment. The Clinton presidency saw the release of the 1994 Nuclear Posture Review, which formally recommended that the capability for using nuclear weapons be removed from all surface ships. Only the TLAM, or Tomahawk missile, was left on submarines for defense purposes. This type of missile would only be removed by the Obama administration, whose Secretary of Defense, Ashton Carter, would say, quote, our intention is to have a military that doesn't need to use nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. We can use conventional forces to prevail anywhere in the world. <laughs>